In this video, you'll learn how to acquire a hyperspectral Raman map using the Hariba Labram Aramis Raman microscope at the Molecular Foundry, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. A hyperspectral map is when you take a Raman or photoluminescent spectrum at every pixel of an image. On the left, you can see an example from a user at the Molecular Foundry, Yin Lu of UC Berkeley. He took PL spectra at every single point on germanium sulfide nanohelices, where the points are defined by the blue box of the bright field image. The peak positions vary with the location, and so the user could visualize this quickly by coloring each pixel by the peak wavelength. So to take these maps, you'll first set up a sample on the Raman microscope using standard procedures that we've covered in previous videos. Then you'll define your region of interest and save a bright field microscope image of it. You'll set the mapping acquisition parameters and then acquire a single piggy bank spectrum to confirm spectral acquisition parameters. You can perform a quick map as a trial and then acquire a more detailed map that might take a longer amount of time. Finally, you'll save this map and you'll process the hyperspectral data. To make a map, you'll first start up the microscope according to the instructions in the Raman Quick Start Manual. All of these operations are described in the general How to Use the Hariba Labram Aramis Raman Microscope video linked in the video description below. Step 2. Defining our region of interest and saving a bright field microscope image. So once you've set up the Raman Microscope and your sample, you want to use the camera icon to take an image of your sample around the area that you want to map. So once you've stopped the camera to freeze that image, you can go to File, Save As to save your image in the .ngv format. It's important that you save it in this format because this allows you to overlay your image onto your hyperspectral map. Next, you will use the square icon on the left-hand toolbar to generate a region of interest. So this is the area that you'll map. So you can either use the square, a circle, a line, or a diagonal line. It doesn't really matter. But whatever the shape is, is going to define your mapping region. Once you see this ROI, you can use the mouse at the corners of this ROI to move the region of interest to wherever you want and resize it. If you don't see the ROI on your screen, you can click on the center cursors button and that will bring the ROI to the center of your image. So once you've set your region of interest, you can set your mapping acquisition parameters. You do this by checking this grid-like icon that says mapping properties. This will open up the mapping properties dialog box and here you can see all of the different parameters that control how dense your map will be. So first you need to set up which variables you want to map. You're going to uncheck all the boxes except for X and Y if you want to take a two-dimensional map. If you want to take a focal series, you would only check Z. So in this case, we're going to take a 2D map. I can set the array size. In this case, I can put it as 10 by 10, or I can set the increment. So here I'll set the increment to three microns instead of 10 microns. So you'll note that when I change the increment, it changes the array size, and when I change the array size, it'll change the increment. I would recommend always taking a coarse map in the beginning so that you don't waste a lot of time taking a map that doesn't have useful information. You can get an estimate for the amount of time that your map will take by looking at the bottom left-hand corner, which has a minimum measurement time. So this will only be accurate if you've already set your acquisition parameters, that is, the parameters that you would use for your piggy bank spectrum. This box also has a checkbox that says use swift mapping for XY scanning. This is a mode in which the stage moves continuously instead of stopping at each pixel. This requires setting some hardware switches that we're not going to cover right now, but you can always ask a super user for instructions how to do this. After setting the mapping acquisition parameters, we now need to set the spectral acquisition parameters and take a piggy bank spectrum just to confirm them. 
So first we'll set the acquisition options. So we'll go to acquisition menu and then options. Here the most important option to set is to set the shutter to always be open. This is because you can waste a lot of time opening and closing the shutter for every pixel. Next, we'll set the spectral acquisition parameters, namely the integration time. You want to set this to be fairly short because otherwise you'll be multiplying that integration time by the number of pixels, which could end up being a very long time. You also don't really want to average very many spectra for the same reasons, and you generally don't want to use extended range mode. You can, of course, do all of these things to get very high quality or broad spectra, but typically when you're mapping, you're trying to focus in on very specific points or wave numbers in your spectrum. So taking a piggy bank spectrum is a really good idea because it lets you know exactly what the instrument will do at every pixel. For example, if you forgot to turn off extended range mode, or if you forgot that you were averaging 10 times, your piggy bank will do this and let you know. It's also important because when you take such short acquisition times, then you'll see what the signal to noise of your spectrum is. And if that's not sufficient for your purposes, then you know that you need to actually increase the integration time. Conversely, if you have a lot of signal, then you can probably reduce the integration time so that your maps don't take as long. So now that we've set up the parameters for both the mapping and the spectral acquisition, we're ready to perform a quick map. So we'll acquire a quick map by clicking on this icon that looks like a grid of spectra. This is the mapping acquisition button. So it can take a little while for the mapping to start. It's pretty processor intensive. I always recommend that you don't have other maps open. So you would want to close all the other maps before you start a mapping acquisition. The hardest part about mapping on the Hariba Raman microscope is not acquiring the data, but it's navigating the user interface. For mapping, I would recommend having three windows open. The first is the point window that shows you your spectrum. Most of the time when you're acquiring data, this spectrum will be the last spectrum that you acquired. But you can actually go to any given point on your map and view the spectrum using the crosshairs tool. So you can set the crosshairs either on the video image, this is the grayscale camera image, or on this map window. So the map window will give you colors for different pixels depending on what you set those colors to be. And we'll get into that in a little bit. If you want to overlay the colored maps, your hyperspectral image onto your video image, you can right click on the video image and select imposition. That will open up this dialog box and you should check overlay images. Then you can click okay. If you don't see any overlay, you would go to the camera image and then click on one of the colored maps, for example, the red or the blue map, and that would overlay whatever map you clicked on onto the video grayscale image. So the most important window is this SPIM window or the spectral image window. Sometimes this shows a huge number of spectra, sometimes it only shows two, but inside this window, regardless of what you see, it contains every single spectrum for every pixel. To set what you visualize, you're going to right click on this window and select spectra. In the spectra dialog box, where it says show, you can click on the drop down menu and you can select either the limits, which would be the highest and lowest spectra, you can select all spectra, which tends to be too much information, or you can select auto, which generally is a good choice. Auto will kind of decide for itself how many spectra it will show you, but generally it'll show you the highest and lowest and some in between. So as you acquire your spectra, you'll start to see the map fill in. Now the map is set by the different regions of interest on your spectra. So you can set the regions of interest 
by selecting the red, green, or blue arrows on the left-hand toolbars. Again, like many other cursors, if you don't see those cursors, if you don't see a vertical red line or a blue line or green line, then you can click on the center cursors button. That should bring those cursors to the middle of your spectrum. And then you can draw a line around the peaks that you're interested in. So in this case, I might want to set a region of interest around my 520 peak of silicon. So I'll set these bars around the 520 peak, or I might want to set some bars around this peak around 900 wave numbers, or maybe I want to set a region of interest for the baseline. So this gives me three different regions of interest. In fact, I can even start processing ratios between these. Okay, so the map will give you the integrated area underneath these curves in that region of interest. So the red region of interest would give me the integrated area of this big 520 peak. So as your map is filling in, you might want to play around with the brightness and the contrast. So you can do this either in the format and scale scaling section, or you can click on the map and select this funny up down icon. What this icon means is that it will change the limits of your intensities so that you can adjust the brightness and contrast. So you're going to click on the map and then drag up or down to make the map brighter or darker. In this way, you can adjust the contrast a little bit more so that it's aesthetically pleasing or gives you the information you want to know. This is particularly useful when you're overlaying your map on top of your bright field image. Now, probably the hardest and most difficult challenge with mapping is trying to figure out what are the best parameters for these maps. And part of the reason why this is so difficult is that the button that controls all of this doesn't have a tooltip. So you want to click on this cryptic button that looks like a spectrum going into a Rubik's cube or a grid of colored boxes. Again, this doesn't have a tool tip, but it's called the map analysis button. This will open up the map analysis window where you can see that you have various check boxes such as red, green, and blue. So if you don't see all three red, green, and blue colored boxes in your map window, you can activate them by clicking on these check boxes. Likewise, if you don't see a point spectrum window, then you would click on this spectrum checkbox down below. So I can check the baseline checkboxes. This will subtract a baseline from the area of each region of interest, where the baseline area is defined by the two points at the ends of the region of interest. So it'll subtract whatever area is below that line down to zero counts. Now, another important point is that if you're just drawing your regions of interest on your spectrum by hand, you're likely to get some very weird limits, um, such as 476.743. And if you're trying to write a paper, it may be a little awkward to describe that in your method section. So you can also just type in the limits for your red, green, and blue regions of interest, for example, going from 475 to 575. So once you're happy with your map analysis parameters, you can click OK. And hopefully by this time, your map is progressing a little further. You also may want to set some of the visualization parameters. So for any graph or image, you can right click on that image or graph and then select format and scale. And so here you can set how you visualize the maps. So in this case, we're initially seeing the three different maps as three different colors, but you can also select overlay and that would make some sort of multicolored image. But generally it's more useful to select tile. So you'll notice that the points generally correlate to the map, but they can be shifted in the X or Y directions. This can happen either because the calibration of the stage is not correct. Otherwise, the detectors sometimes can be adjusted in terms of their parameters 
to correct this kind of offset. When the Raman microscope is done, then your map will be complete. Again, this SPIM window is the most important window. For example, if you want to do any sort of processing or saving, you would operate on this window. All of the maps can be regenerated from the SPIM, but you cannot regenerate the SPIM from the colored maps. So the first thing you want to do when you finish an acquisition of a map is to save that SPIM window. So you'll bring that window to the front by clicking on it and then go to File, Save As. And you're going to save it in the labspec.ngc format. So here we're going to save this file as si-training underscore map dot ngc. We also do need to save the video image, the video camera image, but we've done that already. You can save the maps, but generally you're not going to do that until you've done all your processing. You do the processing on the SPAM. So if you're going to do any baseline subtraction, or you're going to do any smoothing, you would do that on the SPIM window because that contains all of your data. And every operation you do operates on every single spectrum. So once you've taken a coarse map, you can then take a fine map where you have smaller pixel sizes, or maybe you change the spectral acquisition parameters to generate higher quality spectra. Here are some troubleshooting tips. So common problems include maps are shifting over time. You want to make sure that your sample is fixed pretty firmly to the stage. There are clips that you can use to fix your samples to the stage, but most people tend to use a double-sided tape to make sure their samples don't move during a really long map. If you see misalignment between the bright field image and the Raman or PL maps, check to make sure that you have set the correct objective in the software since that sets the calibration of the stage. If your focus varies over uneven samples, you can perform autofocus by selecting autofocus in the acquisition options menu, but this takes many different spectra for each pixel and so it's pretty slow. Ultimately, it takes a lot of practice to make beautiful maps, so just keep on getting experience and your maps will improve over time. So that is taking a Raman map with the LabRAM Aramis microscope. If you have any questions, ask a Raman super user. For additional training on the Raman, check this YouTube channel or the Raman manual.